Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Um, so as I discussed in class, today we're looking at historic astronomy. Um, it's hard to know what we don't know unless we know how we know what we know, you know? If you ask any person who, you know, uh, has studied any discipline, whether it be teaching or um, architecture, any science, geology, oceanography, whatever, you always have to take some time to look at how we know what we know. Um, look at these people who have progressed the discipline from the bottom up. Um, only that way can we really know what we don't know so that we can start adding to that body of knowledge. So today we're going to be really focusing in on historic astronomy. How do we know a lot of the different things that we know? Um, and as a result of that, you'll also see how scientific models change over time, how they uh, get progressively better um, through scientific method, through testing, through observations, through um, uh, better technology. Um, and then how is the nature of science exemplified by contributions of historic astronomers? So um, how does this progression from, you know, thousands of years ago, what we understood, how did we get to where we are today? All right, so let's get into it. So I have this picture on the left-hand side. This is from Northern Europe from about 1600 BC. This is the earliest recorded um, astronomical observation. It was probably used for uh, religious significance, not really sure, but uh, you can, I mean, 1600 BC, quite a long time ago. On the right-hand side are some lecture notes compiled by uh, a monk, um, before the year 1490 in Austria. And so you can see that they were, he's really looking at the, um, the order of the solar system, but also uh, the geometry of eclipses. So um, you can also kind of think I see a sun-centered Earth, or excuse me, a Earth-centered solar system. More early observations. Um, at the very top, you'll see Machu Picchu. Um, if you've ever watched Ancient Aliens, you've probably heard of that term. But uh, it was, you know, a source of ceremony and uh, experimentation and astronomy. And then down at the bottom, um, you know, we've all heard about Stonehenge. Uh, Stonehenge. Uh, of course, was basically a calendar. It was a, computing, a computer for calculating the positions of the planets and the sun, and of course, when to have that big solstice party. Um, but yeah, it was a calendar. It was aligned to the sun. It, it's kind of neat that um, people a thousand years ago, probably or more than a thousand years ago, 2,000 years ago, probably knew more about what was going on in the night sky um, than we do in a lot of ways. Now, we may know the reasons behind some of those movements and observations, but uh, they were really good at making those observations and they, they did a lot. So I wanna read this quote to you. The time will come when diligent research over long periods will bring to light things that now lie hidden. A single lifetime, even though entirely devoted research would not be enough for the investigation of so vast a subject. And so this knowledge will be unfolded throughout long successive ages. There will come a time when our descendants will be amazed that we did not know things that are so plain to them. Many discoveries are reserved for ages still to come when memory of us will have been effaced. Our universe is a sorry little affair unless it has in it something for every age to investigate. Nature does not reveal her mysteries once and for all. This is from Seneca, 65 AD. Um, pretty forward thinking, I mean, um, there will come a time when our descendants will be amazed that we did not know the things that are so plain to them. Sounds kind of familiar, but a modern perspective from a very long time ago, 2000 years ago. So we're actually going to kind of start around 500 BC. Um, Pythagoras um, was kind of the first to suggest that we know of a spherical earth. Um, mainly because he disliked spheres. Uh, if you don't know anything about Pythagoras, he really dug geometry, uh, like almost to the point of a cult. Um, 
but he believed that the sphere was a perfect shape. So he believed that the Earth was spherical. Um, possibly the first to propose a spherical Earth based on actual physical evidence was Aristotle on uh, about 350 BC or so, um, who had lots of arguments for a spherical Earth, including how ships disappear over the horizon. The last thing you see is their mast. Um, Earth cast a round shadow during a lunar eclipse. Um, and then different constellations are visible at different latitudes. So the best way to explain all those observations is spherical Earth. All right, now we get to Eratosthenes and the circumference of the Earth. Um, so around 240 BC, Eratosthenes, angle of the shadow cast by a stick at noon on the summer solstice in Alexandria. Um, and found that angle to be about 7.2 degrees. So um, this is about 1 50th of a complete circle. So you take 7.2 degrees, multiply it, um, you get to 360. Eratosthenes then used this number to calculate the circumference of the Earth um, to be about 250,000 stadia. Um, there's some disagreement about exactly how big stadia was. Um, but he actually hired somebody to walk um, from Alexandria to Syene and uh, using that professional walker, that was his job, um, he calculated pretty accurately the circumference of the earth. Um, of course, we now know that the earth is about 25,000 miles in uh, circumference. At this point, uh, if you would pause the video and there uh, pause my video and there's a little video in the presentation if you'll play that and then come back so how did he calculate the moon so we're going from the earth out so how did aristarchus of samos calculate the size of the moon so we're going to build off of eratosthenes work um uh, Aristarchus was an ancient Greek astronomer, mathematician. Um, I think he really enjoyed, it seemed like from all the readings, um, that he really enjoyed the theory and he wasn't as worried about actual um, numbers because measurements weren't great. But using um, Eratosthenes' measurements, he was kind of the first to calculate the size and distance of the moon and the sun. Um, the size of the moon he did very well. It's a lot closer. The sun was a little bit tougher, and so the uh, his calculation wasn't 100% correct. But you got to remember this was over 2,000 years ago. Um, didn't have all of the tools necessary to accurately do that. But uh, we kind of credit him for being the first to try. So um, Aristarchus of Samos used lunar eclipses, timing of lunar eclipses, lunar eclipses to um, calculate the size of the moon. So some real quick basics. Lunar eclipse is when the shadow of the Earth falls on the moon. It only occurs during new moon phase. Um, it doesn't happen every month because the moon is actually tilted to our plane of orbit. So most of the time our shadow is going to fall below or above the moon. But um, when they do happen, uh, they're pretty spectacular. Um, please pause and watch the video here, Lunar Eclipse 101. Okay, um, one thing I didn't mention is lunar eclipses um, are much more frequent than solar eclipses. Um, the Earth is larger than the moon, so our, our shadow is bigger. Kind of makes sense. So how did Aristarchus calculate the size of the moon? So based on lunar eclipse geometry, sun, Earth, moon. Um, he calculated a lunar eclipse and saw that it took about 50 minutes from the time it was on the verge of going into shadow until it was completely eclipsed. And then 200 minutes passed from that time until it began to emerge on the other side. So from this, he kind of determined that if all the shadows held correctly and operated like they do on Earth, then the moon is gonna be about one quarter the size of the Earth, which turns out to be pretty true. Um, because he could also block out the moon with his pinky. And he measured the length of his arm the unit of pinky finger widths. If you've ever done this trick, you can hold out your thumb uh, to the moon and it's about the same size as your uh, thumbnail uh, at arm's length. 
Um, he used that unit of pinky finger lengths, lengths and found that it was one one hundredth of a ratio. Using like triangles, he could make a prediction about the distance to the moon from the Earth with really good accuracy, surprisingly, using a pinky in your arm um, and, of course, the time of the shadow. Um, he also tried to calculate the distance and size of the sun. Again, he didn't have exactly all the tools necessary to be able to do that, but um, it's an excellent try for over 2,000 years ago. Solar eclipse, basics. Um, solar eclipse is just like a lunar eclipse, but the moon and the sun, uh, moon and the earth are reversed. So in this alignment, you have sun, moon, earth. Um, and the shadow of the moon falls on the earth. They only occur at new moon. There's three types. There's a annual, a annular eclipse, um, which just means that it's at a time of our orbit where the uh, sh the moon doesn't quite cover up the full disk of the sun, so you have some edges around it. And we'll talk about uh, perigee and apogee in just a few minutes. Um, a partial eclipse where um, it depends on where you're on Earth, but uh, a partial eclipse is where the moon doesn't cover up is kind of like above or below it's not right in the middle and then total is where everything's perfect you're right in the middle you're at the right distance to cast uh for the moon to cover up the entire disk of the sun again please pause here and watch solar eclipses 101 all right so first off, total solar eclipse, never look directly into the sun, even during an eclipse. Um, it's very bright still. The corona of the sun is extremely bright. Total solar eclipses really only last a few minutes. Um, so in the path of totality is about 10,000 miles long um, and only about 100 miles wide. So you're talking about a small little 100 mile shadow on the Earth, but it moves because the Earth is, of course, still rotating. But a total solar eclipse is when it lines up just perfectly. Um, in this picture, you can see these people timed it just right. Um, they were in Oregon uh, Smith Rock State Park, climbed up and just had that perfect time. Um, this is called the diamond ring phase. And uh, it's when the sun actually shines through a crater on the moon and it produces an effect that looks like a diamond ring. So perfect time. Annular solar eclipses, because the Earth and Moon don't orbit in perfect circles, they are orbit in ellipses. Um, there are times when the shadow of the Moon or the Moon doesn't quite cover up the full disk of the Sun. Those are called annular solar eclipses. Um, so it's just a little bit too far back. Uh, they're still quite remarkable, but uh, you got to understand we are in a perfect time um, in our planet's geologic history. Millions of years ago, the moon was closer. So you would never have an annular solar eclipse. You would always have either a total or a partial. Um, a few million years from now, the moon will be further away. And so we will always have annular solar eclipses. We, we're just at the right time where the, the moon can be total or it can be annular. Really a uh, special time. Um, the picture down here at the bottom is actually from the International Space Station, and you can see the shadow of the moon right there on the Earth. All right, so let's talk about how Aristarchus tried to calculate the size of the sun um, based on geometry. So Aristarchus believed that the angle made between the center of the Earth, the center of the sun, and the terminator of the first quarter moon was about 87 degrees. Um, First quarter, you got to remember, is kind of like a right angle alignment. That's when we have our um, neap tides. High tides won't be quite as high. Low tides won't be quite as low. So he figured this alignment right here to be about 87 degrees. And since the sun and moon had about the same angular sizes, you know, total solar eclipse, angular solar eclipse, um, this angle could be used to geometrically determine the ratio of the Earth-Moon distance to the Earth-Sun distance. So using that angle of 87 degrees, um, Aristarchus concluded that this distance ratio was about 19, um, suggesting that the Sun's diameter must be at least seven times greater than the Earth's. Again, the problem here was the measurements. Um, his math 
theory was correct, but the actual measurements that he used were wrong. Um, I think it's actually closer to 400, the, the ratio there. So um, didn't get quite the right number, but nevertheless, quite an achievement for over 2,000 years ago. So let me ask you this question. Would these determinations, would these discoveries, size of the Earth, size and distance of the moon and the sun, would they have been possible if we were on another planet? If we were Martians, for example, um, Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos, named after fear and terror. Um, but the largest is only 25 kilometers across um, compared to the moon, which is about two, two, 3,000 kilometers across, something like that. Um, Phobos, this image down here on the left, actually orbits so close to Mars. Um, if you were in the right place, you could see it rise and set twice a day. But for most of Mars, you won't be able to see it. It's also dark. And its orbit is also decaying. It's going to break up um, eventually and crash into crash into Mars. Um, the other one is smaller. Um, Deimos is one of the smallest known moons in the solar system at only 15 kilometers across. These are probably most likely um, captured asteroids from the asteroid belt. But anyway, would we have been able to determine the distance to those? Size of the Earth, would we have been able to do that? Um, I mean, we had to use lunar eclipses, solar eclipses. Would that have been possible? What if we didn't have, an, you know, this perfect alignment of arm and thumb so that the disc or the our thumb or thumbnail doesn't, didn't cover up or cover up too much? of the um of the moon interesting idea all right so let's get into uh some other ideas um moving up ahead so now um we're going to move up to ptolemy uh, born in egypt in 85 a.d so ptolemy was a greek astronomer uh, mathematician he modeled the movements of the sun the moon the five known planets at the time, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter. And he did this with great accuracy. Um, and he developed what was called the geocentric system of orbits and epicycles. Geocentric, geocentered. So Earth centered. Um, in this model, the Earth is considered the center of the solar system, actually the center of the universe at the time. Um, and then the moon, the planets, the sun, and all the stars all rotate around the Earth. Um, they composed the heavens, which at the time they really thought were ethereal and unchanging. And you got to understand this makes perfect sense. When you go outside at night, you see objects orbiting us, Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury, all the stars, they seem to orbit around the earth. So it's easy to get the sense that we are the center of everything. Plus we're humans. We like to be the center of everything, but there's a problem with Ptolemaic geocentrism. If you look at this uh, little animation that I've got, the problem is called retrograde motion. So the planets um, actually derived the word planet from uh, the Greek wanderer, um, but they were called wanderers because at certain times on consecutive nights, they seem to go backwards. It's called retrograde motion. Um, and so Ptolemy kind of explained this by saying, well, the Earth is the center and these planets kind of orbit in these weird curly cues, and that's why they appear to do these retrograde motions um, across the sky. So anyway, please pause here, watch the video geocentrism. Okay. Oops. So most of the time, Planets will move across the sky normally, like this here. So these are consecutive nights. Um, I think this is Mars moving across the sky. But notice how sometimes it will go backwards and then go forwards. So this has made the geocentric model, Ptolemaic's model, very complex. Um, now we understand why. So just read this. Most of the time, the apparent motion of Mars 
in our sky is in one direction, um, slow but steady in front of other stars. But every two years or so, the Earth passes Mars as they orbit around the sun. So you can see in the animation here, the green is Mars, the red, excuse me, the green is the Earth, red is Mars, and you can see what it looks like in the sky. So when it passes, it actually goes backwards and then moves forward. So this is really hard to model in uh, the geocentric uh, view of the universe. But that idea held for a long, long time. Um, kind of the dark ages. Sorry, that's what it was. Um, even though, well, even though there was lots of evidence to suggest that this geocentric model was wrong, people accepted it um, for a thousand years. So then we jump ahead to Nicholas Copernicus in 1543, who suggested a heliocentric model of the solar system. Helio, of course, meaning sun, centric meaning centered. So listen to this quote uh, by Nicholas Copernicus. The scorn which I had reason to fear on account of the novelty and unconventionality of my opinion almost induced me to abandon completely the work which I had undertaken. Astronomy is written for astronomers. To them, my work will seem, unless I'm mistaken, to make some contribution. He was really worried about this model. By putting the sun in the center of the universe and saying that the Earth is no longer the center of the universe, he was really worried. Um, really worried about his his soul, basically. Um, but that model, the heliocentric model, really explains what's going on in the sky. Um, it's a whole lot easier model. By putting the sun in the center, everything makes sense. And that explained retrograde motion. So the ideas of Copernicus were not initially accepted, but within 100 years or so, other scientists were starting to add and making discoveries and supporting that heliocentric theory. We're going to look at um, four, uh, Tycho Brahe, um, Johannes Kepler, uh, of course, Galileo, and then Sir Isaac Newton. Let's start, about, let's start with uh, Tycho Brahe. He was a Danish astronomer. Um, he is famous for making very, very detailed observations of the night sky, planetary positions. Um, from what I understand, he would stay up all night partying for the most part, uh, but making very, very detailed, writing everything down, notes about positions of planets. He was uh, a famous partier. Um, as a matter of fact, he got into a duel with someone and uh, the person cut off his nose and so he had a gold replacement anyway interesting um interesting read about tycho definitely go look that up johannes kepler um tycho's observations and data were so well kept and so elaborate that johannes kepler took that data and began solving the issue of retrograde motion and later creating what we know as the planetary laws. We'll talk about those in just a few minutes. Galileo. While Kepler was working on his laws, Galileo took his telescope and pointed it at the night sky. The telescope wasn't a new invention, but um, it, this one was made to his specifications and allowed him to point it at different things in the night sky, and he started making observations. What you see over on the right-hand side is actually Jupiter, and the little asterisks are moons. Um, he started recording these and recording their position every night. This is kind of what it looks like. So um, here we have Jupiter in the middle. We have this red dot, yellow dot, blue dot, and white dot. Each of those are moons. And over here, you have this, these numbers for reference. So night one, night two, night three, night four, night five, night six, night seven, night eight, night nine. I like this. We'll go back through this. So um, here on the left-hand side are some notes by Galileo on those moons. Um, here on the right-hand side are actually what they look like. Um, this is Io, 
This is going out further away. These are not to scale. Um, IO, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. So clearly the moons of Jupiter orbit very similar to the way our moon orbits, but it doesn't orbit the Earth. And if moons could orbit a different planet, perhaps it was true that the Earth was not the center of the solar system, the universe, after all. With that discovery and his observations of the planet Venus in the same year, Galileo gave us proof of a heliocentric universe. Um, if you look at this picture, Venus goes through phases just like the moon. Anything that can orbit inside of us, so Venus and Mercury and the moon, all go through phases. Everything that's beyond our orbit does not. <clears throat> so this, once and for all, proved that the Earth was not the center of the solar system. Then we get to Johannes Kepler. Using uh, Bryce data um, in the early 1600s, he took those numbers, that quantitative data, and he formulated his three laws of planetary motion. Um, these three laws of planetary motion describe the motion of planets in a sun-centered solar system and really help predict where different planets will be on different nights with great accuracy. Um, Kepler's efforts to explain the underlying reasons for such motion are really no longer accepted, um, but nonetheless, the actual laws themselves are very accurate um, for the motion of a planet and any satellite, including the moon. So here are Kepler's laws that he formulated. The first one, um, a planet orbits the sun in an elliptical orbit. Uh, an ellipse is like an oval. N Orbits are not circular. Please understand that, that they are elliptical. And so if you look at this, this is an elliptical orbit. Imagine um, you have the sun here, and here's your planet. Now it's going to orbit the sun. If you have a piece of paper or a piece of cardboard, and you put two tacks up through the top. You take a string and connect them so that you always have the same length string. Pull it stretched tight those tacks and then draw just like here so Kepler's first law is basically that orbits are not circular they're elliptical and that sometimes they are close it's called perihelion close to the Sun or aphelion farthest from the Sun sometimes they're close sometimes they're far away so if you look at this illustration you can see over here is going to be the furthest away over here is going to be closest aphelion perihelion so this describes something called um eccentricity eccentricity is a measure of how round an ellipse is um, an eccentricity of zero where the two focal points are merged is a perfect circle um, the farther apart those two focal points are the more eccentric the or orbit there's a link here if you'd like to play with it um, you can create these diagrams that i that I did and play with um, how elliptical an orbit can be. So here's a little bit about the Earth. The Earth, of course, is not in a perfect circular orbit, um, although it's really low eccentricity. We we're pretty close. Um, so again, aphelion is the farthest, perihelion closest. I always say the periscope is close to the water. Um, if you look at this picture, this is a picture of the sun at its closest approach back on January 5th. Here is its farthest approach back in June, uh, June 2019. Look at this size difference. It's tiny. Our orbit's really very circular, close to it, but no orbit is perfect, perfectly circular. And so here are some dates for when the Earth is um, closest to the sun and then farthest away. Note that we're closest to the sun in January doesn't have much to do with our seasons, and you can kind of see why. It's very small a difference. All right, Kepler's second law. So Kepler found that an imaginary line between the sun and the planet sweeps out equal amounts of area in equal amounts of time. So this is the same amount of time as this, and it's the same area. It's a 
a product of an elliptical orbit, but also look at what it says about the velocity of the planet. Look how fast it goes um, at perihelion when it's close and then how slow it goes at aphelion. But in equal amounts of time, it sweeps out equal area. <clears throat> and that brings us to um, a real quick discussion of distance that I want to talk about called astronomical units. Um, an astronomical unit is just a measure of distance that we're going to be using uh, from this point on. It is the average distance from the Earth to the sun. That's all it is. Um, 149 kilometers, 93 million miles. So it's the average sun-Earth distance. So the Earth is one astronomical unit away from the sun. Um, Mars is 1.52. Um, anything closer to the sun is going to have a lower number. I think 0.4 for Mercury. I think 0.7 for Venus. Earth is one. And then you can see here Jupiter at six astronomical units, Saturn at 10, uh, Uranus at 20, Neptune at 30. All right, which brings us to third law, Kepler's third law. Kepler's third law states that <clears throat> the orbit of period squared is equal to um, the orbital period squared is equal to the distance of the uh, the distance that the planet orbits cubed, or p squared is proportional to a cubed. <clears throat> so, what it basically says or implies is that the time it takes a planet to orbit the sun increases rapidly the further away you get. So planet like Mercury, um, very close to the sun, um, orbits in 88 days, where the Earth takes 365 and Saturn takes 10,759 days to orbit. So using, you can see the graph here, it, it's almost a perfect relationship. Um, as you get further away from the sun, the orbital period is much longer. Again, please watch the video, um, kind of going into Kepler's laws. All right, last little bit, Sir Isaac Newton. Um, in 1684, Sir Isaac Newton, of course, um, proposed his uh, three laws of motion. Uh, written in Latin, um, one of the most important scientific papers ever written, uh, Principia Mathematica. Anyway, um, in his Law of Universal Gravitation, he explained how the sun's gravity governed the motion of the planets. Um, he, un he developed his understanding of how gravity works by looking at the moon's motion. So the moon orbits around the Earth, of course. Since uh, its size does not appear to change, its distance stays about the same, although we know now, of course, that it does change. Um, so its orbit must be pretty close to a circle. Um, so to keep the moon moving in that circle, the Earth must exert a pull on the moon. And of course, he named that gravity. So, you know, you always heard about the apple tree, um, which we don't know if it's actually true or not. But um, anyway, that's how the story goes. Isaac Newton discovers a talking apple. Do you realize the gravity of the situation? Anyway, cute little joke. But he realized that all objects attract each other with a force, and he discovered that that force is dependent on the masses between them, um, the masses and the distance between them. Two things. Gravity affects everything in the universe. There's a gravitational attraction between me and the Earth. That's the strongest because you know it has a lot of mass, and it's really close. But if the Earth disappeared, on, I would start falling towards the sun because – even though the sun is extremely massive, it's 93 million miles away. So we're closer to the earth. That's why when we jump, we don't go flying off. We go right back to the earth. But we also have a gravitational attraction between us and something, let's say a quasar, 10 billion light years away. Quasar is huge, but it's really far away. So the force of gravity will increase the closer you are and as the ma if the mass is larger. So gravity is dependent on mass and distance. All right, so now if the sun is pulling the planets, why don't they just fall and burn up? 
Well, in addition to falling towards the sun, all planets are moving sideways. They have the sideways motion. You can look at the graph of uh, this little thing here. Um, this is how an orbit works. So if you have a weight on the end of a string and you swing it around, you kind of feel that tug. Um, it's very much the same with gravity. So a planet is moving around like this. That angular momentum allows it to keep going. And so uh, Sir Isaac Newton came up with uh, this thought experiment of a cannon. So you place a cannon on the Earth really high up, and you fire it. If you don't fire it fast enough, it just comes crashing back down to the Earth. If you fire it fast enough to have enough velocity this way, gravity is going to keep it down that way. Orbit. That's all an orbit is. It's getting something fast enough sideways, cutting off the engines, and then letting that angular momentum carry it around. It's falling. It is literally falling around the object, but traveling fast enough so that as it falls, it just follows the curvature. So the force of gravity is pulling it down, but that velocity is keeping it moving. Um, this is why astronauts in the International Space Station float, because they are literally falling. They're just like on uh, the Tower of Terror at Disney World. They're falling, but as they're falling, they're still getting pulled by gravity down, and so it just keeps them in a constant circle constant ellipse. Anyway, watch the video. All right. We're to present, close to present day now. So Newtonian physics works extremely well to see to, and explain what's going on in our solar system. But you got to understand Newton's laws, Kepler's laws are really just describing things. They're not great explanations for why things happen. And that doesn't come until the 1920s with Einstein's theory of general relativity, theory of general relativity. We'll talk a lot more about laws and theories later. Um, Newtonian physics works very well for planet sized objects. Kepler's laws work very well uh, to describe planets um, in our solar system. Um, there are some problems with Kepler's laws, though. They don't fully describe everything. Um, Newtonian physics don't describe everything. They don't describe the very big, um, like galaxies, or very massive, like black holes. Um, they, they do a little bit, but they're not perfect. Um, or the very small, like uh, particle physics, beyond smaller than an atom. So um, it was Einstein that developed the idea for the very big. So um, please watch the video below. Sorry, I didn't want to start that. All right, last little bit. Einstein and beyond. So during a total solar eclipse, um, this guy named Sir Arthur Eddington performs the first experimental test of Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity, which basically says that a mass will curve space and time, and that an orbiting object is just following that curve. So how do you test that? So um, the idea was to go out during a solar eclipse, look at the sun during the solar eclipse, take a picture, and see if there's any stars that are physically behind the sun that we can actually see. Because if general relativity works, the sun will bend the light, will cause space to bend, and it will bend the light around the sun so that the observer will be able to see a star that actually is physically behind the sun and we shouldn't be able to see. Um, and according to his corrected math, um, he made this prediction that it should work. And it did. Uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, he actually became a sir after that, um, created this experimental test um, and it worked. They were able to see stars that they shouldn't have because uh, the sun's mass, huge, huge mass, actually bent space and time around it. Again, please watch the video. All right. And that's pretty much it. That carries us up to where we need to be today. In the next class, what we're going to be doing is looking at um, 
characteristics of the planets, comparing and contrasting, basically. Anyway, hope you learned something. Um, hope you enjoyed it. I do. I always love this stuff. So enjoy talking about it. Um, anyway, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much.